Well, Neville Rand had a zest for politics. His brain was forever crackling with ideas. This allowed him to bound over the time-serving drudgery, which was a lot of most people in public life. And a lot of those cracklish ideas had a devilish venality about them, mostly reserved for opponents, but not too sparingly for allies alike. Devilment was a line on Neville's calling card. He backed himself in to get on top of anyone who represented even the slightest competition. Being the professional he was, he regarded every personality as a problem or a potential one. Whether you were friend or foe, you were psychologically assessed. He possessed an almost lethal dose of inner confidence, the very reservoir a high professional needs to stay in front and on top of the game. That is someone who wanted to change things while simultaneously visiting pain and suffering on his opponents. And Neville, of course, always wanted to do both. He was street smart to a blade-like sharpness. As they say, he could hear the ants chain step. The instinct of the person in the street never left him. Nor did a conscientious understanding of the needs of the mass of them for a helping hand, or as Neville would have put it, a leg up. A smart person like Neville could have ingratiated himself with the top end of town, registered, registered with the silk department, and eased himself into all the reinforcements that that comfort provides. But he didn't. That compelling sense of what was fair and just and what was reasonable, always had the better of him. He knew there was no premium for helping the ordinary bloke in the street, that is, save for the premium of the psychic reward. But an innate sense of what was right and decent drove him on to help them. Neville always found it difficult to suppress the entertainer in him, and contemporary's opponents invariably brought it out. He not only wanted to beat them, but felt compelled to entertain himself doing it. There was a lot of the artist about him. In another life, you might, you might have seen him in theatre or in cabaret. But he understood you could carry an important idea more easily if it was dressed in colour and possessed some poetic movement about it. Better the idea dance across the dispatch box than land like a brick. But Neville used poetry in other ways. I mean, some of you may know. He had a PhD in poetic profanity. <laughs> he, was a he was a champion swearer. He wasn't just even an ordinary swearer. He was a champion one. But importantly, he knew how to employ the profane with much creative flourish for indignation, for rage, or as often as not, in pathos. But it was always effective, partly because no one was ever quite sure how much he really meant it, the inner depth of feeling never being quite revealed. Of course, the turning point in his life was leading New South Wales Labor to victory in 1976. And of course, some of the banners from those years are here today. After Federal Labor lost in 1975, he provided the vivacity to shape a relevant alternative to a relatively old coalition government. He knew a disappointed and disconsolate Labor Party would need new positioning and panache to unseat even a tired government, and he provided it. And it is a matter of record that he went on to lead Labor in winning a record four consecutive terms of office. In doing this, he created a new model of how a Labor government intelligently and expansively led, could relate to much broader sections of the community, broader in fact than the narrower ones traditionally embraced. And that broader embrace brought us rewards in the two so-called Ranslight elections. Neville bought into the interests of the top end of town, as he called it, 
but was never seduced by them. He knew keeping the top end purring made a difference to state economic activity, but that was always in service of his main goal, the interest of the broader public. But he did affect a socio-economic change in Labor's otherwise traditional approach, a change which eased the way and made less controversial the wholesale overturning of the old non-business model by Bob Hawke and by me on coming to government in 1983. I don't think there's any doubt that Neville's leadership and the advent of his government gave heart to the Labor movement as a whole and provided important buoyancy during Labor's challenge to Malcolm Fraser in 1983. And that that buoyancy, of course, was in the most populous state. Of course, in this place, the Town Hall, the venue of Labor annual conferences since the early 1890s, never would have spoken on this platform, generally in that position, on probably 11 or 12 occasions. In those halcyon days when ideas were fought over, when the great contests between the left and the right of the party were at their highest pitch, never would do the annual speech and apply some healing balm. He was always smart enough to ride the divisions rather than fall on any one side. I was party president for four of his 11 years, from 1979 to 1983, following John Ducker's resignation. These were the years of high contretemps, and I did my level best to keep him and his government above the flak. And as you would expect from Neville, not a jot of thanks for it. You know, I'm bloodstained, I'm bloodstained, I'm torn apart, but all in the service of the greater cause. I mean, he was a hard marker. And it's one of the things I trust we had in common. Um, like any Labor leader who had success and longevity, he came in for extra critical scrutiny from the conservative press. You're not allowed to win too easily or for too long. In this case, the Sydney Morning Herald and his coadjutor straightener, the ABC's Four Corners program. In the glory days of the Such Gardner regime at the Herald, Labor leaders were attacked from the left, not the right, from the left. The implicit charge against people like Neville Rann, and I might say later Bob Hawke and me, was that we are not really Labor. We are faux Labor, because in their opinion we did too much for and too, had too much to do with the business community. I christened that particular clutch of journalists the Glebe Point Gulag. <laughs> uh, and quite a few of them still inhabit grey spidery corners. <laughs> I could name names, but this is not the occasion. <laughs> but the constant carping and rumour mongering did wear Neville down but not by enough to stop him winning his great and final victory in 1984. He was always at his best under pressure. You know, I remember having a, a quiet cup, a cup of coffee with him one morning, and I said, how are you, son? He said, well, God, I wish someone would attack us. You know? <laughs> I said, yeah, I know, it's getting dull. It is getting dull. Um, most of us who knew him were pleased that without so much of a change in step, he went on to pursue a successful career in business. And he was able to do so very agreeably in partnership with Malcolm Turnbull. His wife, Jill, who will speak for herself today, relit his life following their marriage in 1976, and their two children, both with us, Harriet and Hugo, must already miss his fatherly countenance, and I'm sure this is true also in the case for Kim and for Glenn. Neville Rand was a big figure, big brained and brave, who straddled the political world for as long as it held his interest. And he left when he'd had enough of it. I doubt there'd be a soul here who would not believe the public of New South Wales owes him a great debt, because the Labor Party certainly does. <laughs>